2021 is a big challenge to us. But also, there is a great blessings that God has prepared. And so we must commit ourselves into the hands of God so that whatever we do, we fulfill his plan in us to give him praise and to the honor of his name. And so this year, we explore into a new horizon of understanding solid biblical truth. Our presentation today is entitled The Verdict from God's Ledger. It is a study based on John 8 and Revelation 3 verses 14 to 22. Because in both chapters, we see the last people of God when Jesus was on earth and the last church. Because they were claiming these things. This is the human appraisal, but in God's ledger, divine assessment, they are totally different and opposite. So let's see what happens. So let's follow me in the heavenly sanctuary because prison truth comes in the heavenly sanctuary. During the time, as recorded in John chapter 8, the religious leaders were testing Jesus on the law. There was an episode that the leader, the chief religious leaders brought to Jesus a woman caught in action in adultery. So Jesus also were testing the religious leader regarding their knowledge of the law. So both sides, the chief priests, were testing Jesus about the law and Jesus, in return, also testing the religious leader regarding their knowledge of the law. So, we will see that human evaluation versus divine evaluation. So, in the Jewish leaders' evaluation sheet, their knowledge of the law, life of faith, and Christ and God, according to their evaluation, 100% accurate and acceptable to God. However, in the ledger of Jesus' evaluation, everything falls short. Here is a lesson that we learn from spiritual Israel and to the Laodicean Adventists. Both literal and spiritual Israel diagnosed with a serious spiritual illness. We will see how the divine physician diagnosed what was the finding of the divine physician about the spirituality of the literal Israel in the last days of Jesus' ministry and the spiritual Israel as mentioned in the book of Revelation, the Laodicea. In fact, Jesus was being trapped by a question. So, but Jesus went to Mount of Olives now. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple. And all the people come to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribe and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. But when they had sat here in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. In the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This be said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So, when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, who is without sin among you? Let him throw a stone at her first. Again, he stopped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus raised himself up, 
And so no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are your accusers of yours? No one has condemned you? He said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have light of life. I like that. They tested Jesus on the law. And Jesus also in return testing them. We found there was a chaos. Because they believed they were the expert of the law. So there is question but a deep ignorant being centered in their lives and God. They are ignorant. You see, verse 13. The Pharisee therefore said to him, You bear witness to yourself? Your witness is not true. And Jesus answered to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from, where I am going, but you do not know where I am coming from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, if I judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bear witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. This word he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid his hands on him, for his hour has not yet come. And so, again, there was a question. It was a guessing question, even simple statement. A question of identity tells us that the religious leaders were empty-headed. Verse 21 says, Then Jesus said to them, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and I will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews says, will he kill himself? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you, you will die in your sin. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have so many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And I speak to the world and those things that I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them about God the Father. Here is now the crisis. The Pharisee and the, para, the, Pharisee and the scribe were the experts of the law. But a simple question of Jesus, they cannot simply answer. They did not know even God the Father. And we will find that in another episode that they are really totally ignorant. So we need to look at, again, the claim. We are descendants of Abraham, but their lives and their actions deny any connection of the faithful Pakya. And Jesus said to them, just I have been saying to you from the beginning, I have many things to say to judge you concerning, but he who sent me is true. And they did not understand. Then Jesus said to them, When the Son of Man is lifted up, then you will know that I am he, that I have done nothing of myself but the Father. And so here is the big narrative. They did not know. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants. And we have never been in bondage. How can you say you made us free? Here is the chaos again. Empty-headed people. They claim to be something. Their evaluation, they are expert of the law. The word of God, the faith, relationship to Abraham. That they are really the children of God, Abraham. But on the contrary, wrong. And Jesus continued. 
Then Jesus said into, uh, again, that the egg really coming from the net. And so, it means to say that they were blind, they have a blind eyes, deep ears, numb brain. Just imagine, Jesus was already three years. He said, who are you? This is an incredible understanding. And Jesus said, a permission. But it is a permission, destroy true negation. Because he said, I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do not do what you have seen with your father is the devil. They answered and said to them, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if Abraham is, if Abraham, we are children of Abraham, you do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man has told the truth to you, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father, the devil. And they said to him, no, 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 no. We were not born in fornication. We have one father, God. Did you understand, my brothers and sisters? At the last years of Jesus' ministry, the ultimatum years given to Israel after Babylonian captivity, we thought that he changed, that he have repented, but he have not. They thought that they are so close with God because they are assured of their own salvation because they are descendants of Abraham. But they deny in their lives and their action. They claim that they are the children of God, but Jesus denied that, that they are really the children of the devil because they are going to harm Jesus. This is a problem. So Jesus rejected them. He denied that they are children of God. Jesus said to them, if you were, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth. I came from God. Or I have come myself, but he sent me. Why you don't understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are your father, the devil. The desires of your fa father was to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. Here is really an ultimatum. Jesus denied that they claim that they are ancestors of Abraham. Jesus denied that they are the children of God in heaven. And his evaluation is 100% accurate. But their human evaluation, they think they are correct, but absolutely opposite. So, he says, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of me, which of you can back me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you be not believe me? He, he of God hears the word, God's word. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Very empathic. My brothers and sisters, many times we claim we are children of God. My question, do we live really like our father of the faithful Abraham? Because Abraham kept God's commandments. They know God's law. He did not harm anybody. But these people who claim to be the children of Abraham, the claim they claim to be the children of God, but they are going to kill Jesus. He did not listen. They did not listen to him because they do not know him. There's something we call that paradox. So the Savior was maligned, was blasphemed, and dishonored. Then the Jews said, answered and said to them, We... Do we not say rightly you are a Samaritan have a demon? How can you tell that in the Son of God, the creator of the universe? And Jesus says, I do not have demon. I honor my father. You dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets and you say if anyone keeps my word he shall never taste death 
are you greater than our father Abraham? He is dead. The prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Did you understand? Sometimes we claim so much. Boasting. But in reality, we are not. We are not. See to it that our claim is on an equal level and equal footing of truth. Because we call that a blasphemy. So they are brutally vicious, foolish, ignorant about what they claim. They are zero in law, zero in faith, zero in believing in Christ, zero in believing who God is. This is the problem. But they claim their religion 100%. We are sure of the kingdom of God. Because we are the children of Abraham. We keep the law. But when Christ was there. The malign, dishonor, viciously abused and misused. It's not what we are doing today. Jesus is not physically here. But what do we do in our lives? That's what Paul saying, you hung Jesus again on the cross. Let me end the chapter 8. Literal Israel in Jesus' days and a spiritual Israel in the last days, the church of Laodicea, because in the ledger of literal Israel, their evaluation 100% sure of the kingdom of God. But the divine ledger tells the very Exact opposite. They are spiritually bankrupt. And so, we need to look at that. Let us look at the last day church of Jesus' evaluation in his divine ledger, the church of Laodicea, the spiritual Israel. Now, there are many appellations of Jesus on the seven churches. But in the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse 14, the appellation of Jesus is, He is the Amen. One of the Old Testament name of God. Meaning, the truth, the God of truth. And then he says, the faithful and true witness. He is faithful in everything. And a true witness of what they have done. And the beginning of all creation. These four appellations of Jesus here in Laodicea, the Amen, faithful, true witness, beginning of creation, we have to understand that there's nothing escaped in the work of the spiritual Laodiceans. So, in the Old Testament, one of the name of God is El Amen. The God of truth, Isaiah 65, 16, means the validator of truth in and of everything. Faithful and true witness means absolute impartiality and Jesus in whom all creation had its beginning knows from beginning to end as the alpha and omega of absolute details of the knowledge I know your works that's what Jesus said so let's look at Jesus evaluation versus Laodicean evaluation the divine assessment says I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is verses 15 and 16. So Laodicean was diagnosed with a very serious illness, yet did not know. Why? We'll see. Because Laodicea has its own measurement, but not God's measuring standard. Jesus says, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. Danger. Jesus, majority of people, especially the blind spiritual leaders, speak. Really a black stigma on Jesus. That's why he said, what do you when all men speak well of you? For he did their fathers to the false prophet. Luke 6.26. 
For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So here is the problem of Laodicea. The person that claims we are before God is dangerous. So who are we before God is dangerous? And Jesus repeat that. I bear witness of myself. My witness, if it is not true, but if there is a witness of me, I know. My witness is true. But Laodicea, let's see. Laodicea has no other witness. Jesus is the amen, the true and faithful witness. He has a witness. He is God who witnessed and testified the work of Laodicea. But who is the witness of Laodicea? No one. That's why Jesus says, I know your works. But Laodiceans do not know that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3, 4, verse and verse 18. Do you, you understand that? The claim is so big. What was the claim? Why God abhor this description? For it seems he was wrong in human eyes. The claim and the evaluation is perfect in the eyes of God. But in God's ledger, absolutely zero. Why? I know your works. You are not hot nor cold. This is the first diagnosis of the spiritual condition of Laodicea and Seventh-day Adventists. For Jesus declared, I wish you are cold or hot. He prefers only one state of condition, either cold or totally hot. Because hot or cold water, either you drink it or a shower, provides refreshment. But Laodicea was not providing expected water of refreshing refreshment, for it is lukewarm. It is no sitting. The Greek word emisai, we get the word emetic, which means a mixture of a glove of medical doctors give to a person when they swallow a poison. It makes them vomit. So emisai means to spit, to spew, to vomit in consequences or the result. The tipping church make Jesus vomit. There's nothing mediocre in serving the Lord in his church. Lukewarm. The result of Laodicea's work, lukewarm. Lukewarmness is the direct result of Laodicea's work. God knows. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will spew you or vomit you out of my womb. Let's look at a little bit the historical background of this particular local church. City of Laodicea was located between the cities of Heropolis and Colossus. Both cities were known for pure waters that flowed through them. Nearby Heropolis had a spring flowing with hot medicinal water. Nearby Colossan, known for its cold, referencing mountain springs. Laodicea, on the other hand, was a renowned for its dirty, lukewarm water, which visitors almost immediately spat out after tasting. In the light of this, we can say that both hot, like a hot shower, or cold, like a refreshing drink, were considered both good and useful. Yet the lukewarm water of Laodicea was of little or no good use at all. And so, since hot and cold were considered good, helpful, useful, in the biblical image, hot is often used to convey the idea of great spiritual fervor, a fire of the Holy Spirit. Hot are people who follow and serve with enthusiasm, passion, and power of God. While cold, on the other hand, is open, used to describe one spiritually dead and feeling a cold-hearted and a half-hearted person. Therefore, the state of being lukewarm, meaning tepid, snug, tall, that God detests a serious spiritual sickness. The potential rebuke is intended for discipline, not punishment. This is clear, as Jesus states. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be jealous, therefore, and repent. Just imagine that. 
We need to repent. Like Paul in the discipline of my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he, he scourges every son whom he receives. Hebrews 12, verses 5 and 6. So, here is the analogy of water and the Holy Spirit. The Laodicea is lukewarm. There is no power coming from the Holy Spirit. The water in Laodicea, as analogy of their own spiritual condition, instead of being useful in the service of the Lord as hot and cold waters of the area where he was pulled, they were comparable to virtually useless water on their own city. The Lord also rebuked them by spitting them out of his mouth. Water is typological context of Jesus and his church is a symbol of spirit. Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone who's thirsty, let him come and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I will pour out water in abundance of a thirsty land and stream of the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit of your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Whoever drinks the water I will give shall never thirst. Laodicean church claiming to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Because they said, we I do need nothing. I'm growing us in abundance in richness. But in God's leisure, they are the most pathetic. Let's look at it again. Because you have said, I am rich. I have become wealthy. I need of nothing. Wow, that's an arrogant claim. And we find that the church today, everything is good, everything is good. Question. Is what we have presented before public that is acceptable to God? Yes, the church becomes so wealthy. That's why I said, no, nothing. We pretend we need the Holy Spirit, but actually we denied the access of his power. You do not know that you are rich, miserable, poor and blind and naked. This is the divine diagnosis. Found out of severe or Ill, serious illness. But the client have no idea of the illness. All whatsoever. Totally blind. The church become focused on temporary riches. And wealth with pride and spiritual complacency being the result. Blinded by worldly material things. The same to equip spiritual things with earthly things. That's the problem. Laodicea is a hard-faced church before God. Laodicea has no reserved modesty. This church is notoriously hard-faced before God. Can afford to declare to God a blatant self-centered independence. I am rich. I have become wealthy and have made of nothing. This signifies that they need no more of knowledge and wisdom. From any source, it is evident what has been said above because it is a consequence. The church, no discernment, and did not consider Jesus' omniscient power who declared, I know your works. The expression need nothing is a deadly cancer of this church. They do not know that they are fallen. Christ tells the Laodiceans, wretched, petitable, poor, blind, and naked, a quiet slap on the face. But the deep of their fall is understood by the fact that Jesus says, you do not know. This is perhaps the biggest indictment of the church. They are deeply fall into sin. What is worse is that they do not seem to realize that they are deeply in sin. They have become so immersed in thinking attitude of the culture around them. They do not see how far they have fallen from the gospel truth. They cannot see how spiritually poor they are 
for they are gazing at the material world. Spiritual Israel with Laodicean condition is a deadly sick and know it not. Laodiceans are having severe disease. The divine physician found hope. If Laodicean would acknowledge the real condition and obey the divine prescription for total healing, here is the counsel. I counsel you to buy me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. It's not our works. It's not our activities. It's not our accomplishment. We need to replace that exchange with the gold of God. And that's a symbol of a genuine faith. The white garments that you may be clothed. Because our righteousness according to Isaiah is filthy rags. But we do not see because now this year do not know. The righteousness of Jesus Christ. The shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eyes of that you may see. Oh, we see. We are finishing God's work. I'm not against the church. I love this church because we are in the last church. But I have listened to what Jesus is saying. In my evaluation, Nothing in me can recommend me that I am rich. It's a totally wrong. We see what we have accomplished. Yes, but we have a different motive that makes it non-acceptable to God. And we need to understand, my brothers and sisters, only divine intervention can remedy the illness. By calling wretched, petitionable Jesus strike the blow of inordinate pride. He then lit, hits them by calling poor, despite of full bank accounts, money, properties. In contrast to these mirrors, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. Opposite to Laodicea. Jesus described the spiritually rich. Although materially poor. The Greek word for poor in Revelation 3.17 is stokos. Meaning extremely poverty. It is diametrically opposed to the claim. Growing rich and need of nothing. So complacent. Just to accomplish for the sake of doing it. Laodicean thought their wealth was a sign of God's blessing upon them. In other words... God clearly did not have a problem with them because he granted them riches. But they have a wrong thinking and wrong evaluation. This equating of worldly gain with the blessing of God is not without scriptural foundation. It is open abuse. God showed his favor to Solomon, making him wealthy. He blessed Joseph with earthly riches. However, God doesn't always bless that way. And why God would bless the disobedient? If we will see in a few verses, he chastened those whom he loves. Why? He allowed them to sin, not to bring, and not to bring to discipline upon them. Perhaps the wealth of Laodiceans was given by God not to bless, but to expose their dependence on material position and the shallowness of their faith. Let's look at gold. It implies Laodicea had been rich in worldly wealth and riches like gold. God need to exchange with his gold tried in fire. The gold constitutes the richness of God's love, grace, and the mercy of Jesus. The richness towards God in his spiritual sense the gold is a genuine faith, lasts to the end. This will make Laodicea truly and authentically rich. They are naked. A spiritual aid bear Christ truly knows their works. Laodicea has thriving a garment trade, particularly noted for black woolen garments. They have a robe of righteousness by works, not the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
They are blind, not seeing the foolishness of trading of the gospel for temporal security, wealth, and riches. The city was known as a bit of medical center. The colerium, famous for eye sub, that was to be quite effective. But the reference to the blindness and nakedness would have been particularly meaningful to the Lodicean. And Jesus says, Eyes is the light of the body, but if the eyes is defective, there will be darkness. So Jesus warned, if therefore the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? This is what happened to Laodicea. They think they have all the light and they have nothing. But that is not the evaluation. Not seeing, not hearing this expression means in the Old Testament as rebellious. Because seeing, they do not see. Hearing, they do not hear. They do not understand. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. The expression found in Ezekiel indicates rebellion. Son of man, dwell in the midst of rebellious house with eyes to see but do not see. Ears to hear, but do not hear. They are rebellious house. Ezekiel 12, 2. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit appeal. He who has ear, let him hear what the Holy Spirit says to the churches. It's a very interesting. This church. Here is the message from Ellen White. Ellen White says, we are 70 Adventists. That's our name. But the message of the Laodicean is applicable to 70 Adventists who have a great light and have not walked in that light. Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 66. That's a pathetic statement. We have a great light, but we have not walked. Just like Jesus says, I know your works. You claim you are rich and in need of nothing, but you are miserable, blind, naked, and poor. Ellen White says, I saw the testimony of the true witness has not been half hidden. The solemn testimony upon the destiny of the church hangs upon lightly esteemed, if not entirely discarded. This testimony must work deep repentance. All truly who receive it will obey it and purify it. I find in church today, we're in the most confused in the time in our history. Many discarded the spirit of prophecy. Many just have, many one fourth. Not totally. This is walking in a great light, but we have not walked. We have given a great light, but we have not walked. That's why Ellen White says the first chapter of Isaiah is a description of people who professedly serving God but walking in the forbidden path. This incredible statement from Ellen White. The message to the Laodicea. God is leading out of people. He has chosen people, church on earth, whom he made depository of his law. He has committed to them sacred trust and eternal truth to be given to the world. He would probe and correct them. The message to the Odysseans is applicable to the seventh Adventists who have a great light and have not walked in that light. It is those who made great profession but have not keep in step with their leader that will be spewed out of the mouth unless they repent. The divine credentials message pronounced the seventh Adventist Babylon and to call out of there does not come from any heavenly messenger but any human agent inspired by spirit of God. My brothers and sisters, let us evaluate. Are we complacent? I have mentioned that several in our episode. See to it that you are not the foolish virgin. See to it that you are not the goats. See to it that you are a faithful servant. Because there is no other choice. There is no neutral. Either we walk in the narrow way or we walk in the broad way. There's no such thing as walking in the two roads. That's why there is a chicken. 
I asked the meaning of seeking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by a strict testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Messiah. This will have effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exact standard and prove the straight truth. Some will not bear the straight testimony. They rise against it and it will cause shaking among God's people. You look at anywhere. In the internet. How many have left the church because of this reason? Oh, we don't believe anymore this one. That is good for the early pioneers, but does not need, we don't need that in the end time. What a problem. Jesus says, the overcomer. He gave us grace to sustain us. Jesus counsel of the true witness. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be jealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come to him. Dine with him, he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. I will also overcome and sat down with my father's throne. He was an early team here. Of all the seven churches, this is the worst of all the seven churches because it has no commendation. It is the worst of the seven churches because Jesus is outside knocking. It means to say, our going to the kingdom of God is heartfelt, voluntary, surrender to God. He's knocking. All of the six churches, Jesus was inside. And what is worse is that you do not know. I do not know. We have to listen to the diagnosis of the divine physician. What is our problem? Both Jesus, the true witness and the spirit are pleading to listen and obey. It is only the remedy for Laodicean serious illness as a response to Jesus' love for this end time church. My brothers and sisters, you don't look for a perfect church. Find the church which is miserable, naked, poor, miserable. You will find Christ. But don't stay on that condition because there is a divine prescription. We need to exchange our worldly wealth with the true richness of heaven. And then we become his man. So the divine prescription of serious illness of Laodicea, everyone who professes to be an Adventist should listen to the divine assessment of Laodicea. Obey the prescription of the counsel of the true witness, Jesus Christ, to be an overcomer. I love this church. There is no other church. We cannot go to other churches because there is none. Because this is the only last church. Yet the picture is that we need to understand. Let's not stand with a complacent spirituality. We come to church for maintenance rather than closer relationship. How many sermons of revival we are not revived? The reason because this church is destitute of the Holy Spirit. But we brag. I'm not against this church. I love this church. But I want to share to you my understanding because I have not read that many, many years ago. I did not understand what I read until I come to understand what I have performed is from my own resources. The way I understood it. If we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, because we follow the prescription of divine precision. He loves us so much. This church appeared to fall, but it will never fall. God's love is the magnet that maintains it to the end until eternity. 
Jesus loved the church of Laodicea. It is the only good thing about this church. But our accomplishment, if we keep on boasting, just imagine, I have listened to the report of the JER Conference archives. We lost 15 million people. We baptized thousands. We lost millions. We must accept the truth. That we are not doing fine. Let us serve the Lord not for maintenance of our salary. Let's serve the Lord with a passion of fire. The fire that would remove the dross of our character and what is seen is Christ because we accepted his richness, not the richness of the world. We accepted his garment of righteousness, not our filter of righteousness we have done with the works. May this year is, is a big challenge for each one of us. One this is my prayer that each one of us read these verses of Revelation 3 in Laodiceans together with the writings of Ellen White so that we will awaken from our deep slumber of illness in spirituality. May the Lord grant us his blessing. We accept his divine prescription. The divine ledger tells us zero. But there is help. Human ledger and evaluation, 100% commendable, acceptable to God. But in the end, zero. May the Lord can vex us wholeheartedly because I love this church. I love my God. I love this church, no matter what is the fact. But we need to listen to God. We hope that our message today will awaken us and look at in a new perspective and horizon as we look at and travel, journey with our Lord in the year 2021. May the Lord bless us. This is my prayer.